Chapter Seven. The youth cringed as if discovered in a crime. By heavens, they had one after all. The imbecile line had remained and become victors. He could hear cheering. He lifted himself upon his toes and looked in the direction of the fight. A yellow fog lay wallowing on the treetops. From beneath it came the clatter of musketry. Hoarse cries told of an advance. He turned away, amazed and angry. He felt that he had been wronged. He had fled, he told himself, because annihilation approached. He had done a good part in saving himself, who was a little piece of the army. He had considered the time, he said, to be one in which it was the duty of every little piece to rescue itself if possible. Later the officers could fit the little pieces together again and make a battle front. If none of the little pieces were wise enough to save themselves from the fury of death at such a time, why then, where would be the army? It was all plain that he had proceeded according to very correct and commendable rules. His actions had been sagacious things. They had been full of strategy. They were the work of a master's legs. Thoughts of his comrades came to him. The brittle blue line had withstood the blows and won. He grew bitter over it. It seemed that the blind ignorance and stupidity of those little pieces had betrayed him. He had been overturned and crushed by their lack of sense in holding the position, when intelligent deliberation would have convinced them that it was impossible. He, the enlightened man who looks afar in the dark, had fled because of his superior perceptions and knowledge. He felt a great anger against his comrades. He knew it could be proved that they had been fools. He wondered what they would remark when later he appeared in camp. His mind heard howls of derision. Their density would not enable them to understand his sharper point of view. He began to pity himself acutely. He was ill-used. He was trodden beneath the feet of an iron injustice. He had proceeded with wisdom, and from the most righteous motives under heaven's blue only to be frustrated by hateful circumstances. A dull, animal-like rebellion against his fellows, war in the abstract, and fate grew within him. He shambled along with bowed head, his brain in a tumult of agony and despair. When he looked loweringly up, quivering at each sound, his eyes had the expression of those of a criminal who thinks his guilt and his punishment great, and knows that he can find no words. He went from the fields into a thick wood as if resolved to bury himself. He wished to get out of hearing of the crackling shots which were to him like voices. The ground was cluttered with vines and bushes, and the trees grew close and spread out like bouquets. He was obliged to force his way with much noise. The creepers catching against his leg cried out harshly as their sprays were torn from the barks of trees. The swishing saplings tried to make known his presence to the world. He could not conciliate the forest. As he made his way, it was always calling out protestations. When he separated, embraces of trees and vines and disturbed foliages waved their arms and turned their face leaves toward him. He dreaded lest these noisy motions and cries should bring men to look at him. So he went far, seeking dark and intricate places. After a time, the sound of musketry grew faint and the cannon boomed in the distance. The sun, suddenly apparent, blazed among the trees. The insects were making rhythmical noises. They seemed to be grinding their teeth in unison. A woodpecker stuck his impudent head around the side of a tree. A bird flew on, light-hearted wing. Off was the rumble of death. It seemed now that nature had no ears. This landscape gave him assurance, a fair field holding life. It was the religion of peace. It would die if its timid eyes were compelled to see blood. He conceived nature to be a woman with a deep aversion to tragedy. He threw a pine cone at a jovial squirrel, and he ran with chattering fear. High in a treetop he stopped, and poking his head cautiously from behind a branch, looked down with an air of trepidation. The youth felt triumphant at this exhibition. There was the law, he said. Nature had given him a sign. The squirrel, immediately upon recognizing danger, had taken to his legs without ado. 
He did not stand stolidly, bearing his furry belly to the missile and dive with an upward glance at sympathetic heavens. On the contrary, he had fled as fast as his legs could carry him, and he was but an ordinary squirrel, too, doubtless no philosopher of his race. The youth wended, feeling that nature was of his mind. She reinforced his argument with proofs that lived where the sun shone. Once he found himself almost into a swamp, he was obliged to walk upon blog tufts and watch his feet to keep from the oily mire. Pausing at one time to look about him, he saw, out at some black water, a small animal pounce in and emerge directly with a gleaming fish. The youth went again into the deep thickets. The brushed branches made a noise that drowned the sounds of cannon. He walked on, going from obscurity into promises of a greater obscurity. At length he reached a place where the high arching boughs made a chapel. He slowly pushed the green doors aside and entered. Pine needles were a gentle brown carpet. There was a religious half-light. Near the threshold he stopped, horror-stricken at the sight of a thing. He was being looked at by a dead man, who was seated with his back against a column-like tree. The corpse was dressed in a uniform that once had been blue, but it was now faded to a melancholy shade of green. The eyes staring at the youth had changed to a dull hue to be seen on the side of a dead fish. The mouth was open. Its red had changed to an appalling yellow. Over the gray skin of the face ran little ants. One was trundling some sort of a bundle along the upper lip. The youth gave a shriek as he confronted the thing. He was for moments turned to stone before it. He remained staring into the liquid-looking eyes. The dead man and the living man exchanged a long look. Then the youth cautiously put one hand behind him and brought it against a tree. Leaning upon this, he retreated, step by step, with his face still toward the thing. He feared that if he turned his back, the body might spring up and stealthily pursue him. The branches pushing against him threatened to throw him over upon it. His unguided feet, too, caught aggravatingly in brambles, and with it all he received a subtle suggestion to touch the corpse as he thought of his hand upon it he shuddered profoundly at last he burst the bounds which had fastened him to the spot and fled unheeding the underbrush he was pursued by a sight of the black ants swarming greedily upon the gray face and venturing horribly near to the eyes after a time he paused and breathless and panting listened he imagined some strange voice would come from the dead throat and squawk after him in horrible menaces. The trees about the portal of the chapel moved sullenly in the soft wind. A sad silence was upon the little guarding edifice. Chapter 8 The trees began softly to sing a hymn of twilight. The sun sank until slanted bronze rays struck the forest. There was a lull in the noises of insects, as if they had bowed their beaks and were making a devotional pause. There was silence, save for the chanted chorus of the trees. Then, upon this stillness, there suddenly broke a tremendous clangor of sounds. A crimson roar came from the distance. The youth stopped. He was transfixed by this terrific melody of all noises. It was as if worlds were being rended. There was the ripping sound of musketry and the breaking crash of the artillery. His mind flew in all directions. He conceived the two armies to be at each other panther fashion. He listened for a time. Then he began to run in the direction of the battle. He saw that it was an ironical thing for him to be running thus toward that which he had been at such pains to avoid. But he said in substance to himself that if the earth and the moon were about to clash, many persons would doubtless plan to get upon the roofs to witness the collision. As he ran, he became aware that the forest had stopped its music, as if at last becoming capable of hearing the foreign sounds. The trees hushed and stood motionless. Everything seemed to be listening to the crackle and clatter and ear-shaking thunder. The chorus pealed over the still earth. It suddenly occurred to the youth that the fight in which he had been was, after all, but perfunctory popping. In the hearing of this present din, he was doubtful if he had seen real battle scenes. This uproar explained a celestial battle. It was tumbling hordes a struggle. 
in the air, reflecting, he saw a sort of humor in the point of view of himself and his fellows during the late encounter. They had taken themselves and the enemy very seriously, and had imagined that they were deciding the war. Individuals must have supposed that they were cutting the letters of their names deep into everlasting tablets of brass, or in shining their reputations forever in the hearts of their countrymen, while as to fact the fair would appear in printed reports under a meek and immaterial title. But he saw that it was good, else he said in battle every one would surely run, save forlorn hopes and their ilk. He went rapidly on. He wished to come to the edge of the forest, that he might peer out. As he hastened, there passed through his mind pictures of stupendous conflicts. His accumulated thought upon such subjects was used to form scenes. The noise was as the voice of an eloquent being, describing. Sometimes the brambles formed chains and tried to hold him back. Trees confronting him stretched out their arms and forbade him to pass. After its previous hostility, this new resistance of the forest filled him with a fine bitterness. It seemed that nature could not be quite ready to kill him. But he obstinately took roundabout ways, and presently he was where he could see long grain walls of vapor, where lay battle lines. The voices of cannon shook him. The musketry sounded in long, irregular surges that played Hovick with his ears. He stood regardant for a moment. His eyes had an awestruck expression. He gawked in the direction of the fight. Presently he proceeded again on his forward way. The battle was like the grinding of an immense and terrible machine to him. Its complexities and powers, its grim processes, fascinated him. He must go close and see it produce corpses. He came to a fence and clambered over it. On the far side the ground was littered with clothes and guns. A newspaper folded up lay in the dirt. A dead soldier was stretched with his face hidden in his arm. Further off there was a group of four or five corpses, keeping mournful company. A hot sun had blazed upon the spot. In this place the youth felt that he was an invader. This forgotten part of the battleground was owned by the dead men, and he hurried in a vague apprehension that one of the swollen forms would rise and tell him to be gone. He came finally to a road from which he could see in the distance dark and agitated bodies of troops, smoke-fringed. In the lane was a blood-stained crowd streaming to the rear. The wounded men were cursing, groaning, and wailing. In the air always was a mighty swell of sound that seemed to sway the earth. With the courageous words of the artillery and the spiteful sentences of the musketry mingled red cheers, and from this region of noises came the steady current of the maimed. One of the wounded men had a shoe full of blood. He hopped like a schoolboy in a game. He was laughing hysterically. One was swearing that he had been shot in the arm through the commanding general's mismanagement of the army. One was marching with an air imitated of some sublime drum major. Upon his features was an unholy mixture of merriment and agony. As he marched, he sang a bit of doggerel in a high and quivering voice, Sing a song of victory! pocket full of bullets, five and twenty dead men baked in a pie. Parts of the procession limped and staggered to this tune. Another had the gray seal of death already upon his face. His lips were curled in hard lines, and his teeth were clenched. His hands were bloody from where he had pressed them upon his wound. He seemed to be awaiting the moment when he should pitch headlong. He stalked like the specter of a soldier his eyes burning with the power of a stare into the unknown. There were some who proceeded sullenly, full of anger at their wounds, and ready to turn upon anything as an obscure cause. An officer was carried along by two privates. He was peevish. "'Don't jiggle so, Johnson, you fool!' he cried. "'Think my leg is made of iron? If you can't carry me decent, put me down and let someone else do it.' He bellowed at the tottering crowd who blocked the quick march of his bearers. "'Say, make way there, can't you? Make way, Dickens, take it all!' They sulkily parted and went to the roadsides. As he was carried past, they made pert remarks to him. When he raged in reply and threatened them, they told him to be damned. The soldier of one of the tramping bearers knocked heavily into the spectral soldier, who was staring into the unknown. The youth joined his crowd and marched along with it. 
The torn bodies expressed the awful machinery in which the men had been entangled. Orderlies and couriers occasionally broke through the throng in the roadway, scattering wounded men right and left, galloping on, followed by howls. The melancholy march was continually disturbed by the messengers, and sometimes by bustling batteries that came swinging and thumping down upon them, the officers shouting orders to clear the way. There was a tattered man, fouled with dust, blood and powder stained from hair to shoes, who trudged quietly at the youth's side. He was listening with eagerness and much humility to the lurid descriptions of a bearded sergeant. His lean features wore an expression of awe and of admiration. He was like a listener in a country store to wondrous tales told among the sugar barrels. He eyed the storyteller with unspeakable wonder. His mouth was agape in yokel fashion. The sergeant, taking note of this, gave pause to his elaborate history while he administered a sardonic comment. "'Be careful, honey. You'll be a-catchin' flies,' he said. The tattered man shrank back, abashed. After a time he began to sidle near to the youth, and in a different way try to make him a friend. His voice was gentle as a girl's voice, and his eyes were pleading. The youth saw with surprise that the soldier had two wounds, one in the head, bound with a blood-soaked rag, and the other in the arm, making that member dangle like a broken bow. After they had walked together for some time, the tattered man mustered sufficient courage to speak. "'Was a pretty good fight, wasn't it?' he timidly said. The youth, deep in thought, glanced up at the bloody and grim figure with its lamb-like eyes. "'What? Was a pretty good fight, wasn't it?' "'Yes,' said the youth shortly. He quickened his pace. But the other hobbled industrially after him. There was an air of apology in his manner but he evidently thought that he needed only to talk for a time, and the youth would perceive that he was a good fellow. "'Was well, a pretty good fight, wasn't it?' he began in a small voice, and then he achieved the fortitude to continue. "'Durn me, if I ever see fellows fight so, loves how they did fight. I know the boys, like when they once got square at it, the boys ain't had no fair chance to come in now, but this time they showed what they was.' I know did it turn out this way. You can't lick them boys. No, sir. They're fighters, they be. He breathed a deep breath of humble admiration. He had looked at the youth for encouragement several times. He received none. But gradually he seemed to get absorbed in his subject. I was talking across pickets with a boy from Georgie once. And that boy, he says, your fellows, they'll all run like hell when they once hear a gun. He says, maybe they will, I says. But I don't believe none of it, I says, and but Jimmy, I see back to em, maybe your fellows, they'll all run like hell. When once they heard a gun, I says, he larfed. Well, they didn't run day, did they? No, sir, they fit and fit and fit. His homely face was suffused with the light of love for the army, which was to him all things beautiful and powerful. After a time, he turned to the youth. Where you hit, old boy? he asked in a brotherly tone. You felt instant panic at this question, although at first its full import was not borne in upon him. What? he asked. Where he hit? repeated the tattered man. Why, began the youth, I, I, that is why I. He turned away suddenly and slid through the crowd. His brow was heavily flushed, and his fingers were picking nervously at one of his buttons. He bent his head and fastened his eyes studiously upon the button as if it were a little problem. The tattered man looked after him in an astonishment. Chapter 9 The youth fell back in the procession until the tattered soldier was not in sight. Then he started to walk on with the others. But he was amid wounds. The mob of men was bleeding. Because of the tattered soldier's question, he now felt that his shame could be viewed. He was continually casting sidelong glances to see if the men were contemplating the letters of guilt he felt burned into his brow. At times he regarded the wounded soldiers in an envious way. He conceived persons with torn bodies to be peculiarly happy. He wished that he too had a wound, a red badge of courage. The spectral soldier was at his side like a stalking reproach. The man's eyes were still fixed in a stare into the unknown. His gray, appalling face had attracted attention in the crowd, and men, slowing to his dreary pace, were walking with him. They were discussing his plight, questioning him, 
and giving him advice. In a dogged way he repelled them, signing to them to go on, leave him alone. The shadows of his face were deepening, and his tight lips seemed holding in check the moan of great despair. There could be seen a certain stiffness in the movements of his body, as if he were taking infinite care not to arouse the passion of his wounds. As he went on, he seemed always looking for a place, like one goes to choose a grave. Something in the gesture of the man, as he waved the bloody and pitying soldiers away, made the youth start as if bitten. He yelled in horror, tottering forward, he laid a quivering hand upon the man's arm. As the latter slowly turned his wax-like features toward him, the youth screamed, "'God! Jim Conklin!' The tall soldier made a little commonplace smile. "'Hello, Henry,' he said. The youth swayed on his legs and glared strangely. He stuttered and stammered, uh, "'Jim! Jim! Oh, Jim!' The tall soldier held out his gory hand. There was a curious red and black combination of new blood and old blood upon it. "'Where you been, Henry?' he asked. He continued in a monotonous voice. "'I thought maybe he'd get killed over. There been thundering to pay today.' I was worrying about it a good deal. The youth still lamented. Oh, Jim! Oh, Jim! Oh, Jim! You know, said the tall soldier, I was out there. He made a careful gesture. Lord, what a circus! By Jiminy, I got shot. I got shot. Yes, by Jiminy, I got shot. He reiterated this fact in a bewildered way, as if he did not know how it came about. The youth put forth anxious arms to assist him, but the tall soldier went firmly on as if propelled. Since the youth's arrival as a guardian for his friend, the other wounded men had ceased to display much interest. They occupied themselves again in dragging their own tragedies toward the rear. Suddenly, as the two friends marched on, the tall soldier seemed to be overcome by a terror. His face turned to a semblance of gray paste. He clutched the youth's arm and looked all about him, as if dreading to be overheard. Then he began to speak in a shaking whisper. "'I tell you what I'm afraid of, Henry. I'll tell you what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid I'll fall down. And, and then, you know, them damned artillery wagons, they like as not them run over me. That's what I'm afraid of.' The youth cried out at him hysterically. I'll take care of you, Jim. I'll take care of you. I swear to God I will. You sure, will you, Henry? Tall soldier besieged. Yes, yes, I tell you, I'll take care of you, Jim, protested the youth. He could not speak accurately because of the gulpings in his throat. But the tall soldier continued to beg in a lowly way. He now hung babe-like to the youth's arm. His eyes rolled in the willingness of his terror. Oh, always a good friend to you. Wasn't I, Henry? I always been a pretty good feller, ain't I? It, it ain't much to ask, is it? Just to pull me along out there on the road? I'd do it for you, wouldn't I, Henry? He paused in a piteous anxiety to await his friend's reply. The youth had reached an anguish where the sobs scorched him. He strove to express his loyalty, but he could only make fantastic gestures. However, the tall soldier seemed suddenly to forget all those fears. He became again the grim, stalking specter of a soldier. He went stonily forward. The youth wished his friend to lean upon him, but the others always shook his head and strangely protested. No, no, no. Leave me be. Leave me be. His look was fixed again upon the unknown. He moved with mysterious purpose, and all of the youth's offers he brushed aside. No, no. Leave me be. Leave me be. The youth had to follow. Presently the latter heard a voice talking softly near his shoulders. Turning, he saw that it belonged to the tattered soldier. You'd better take him out into the road, partner. There's a battery coming, belly whoop down the road, and, and he'll get runned over. He's a goner anyhow in about five minutes. You can see that. You'd better take him out of the road. Where the blazes does he get his strength from? Lord knows cried the youth. He was shaking his hands hopelessly. 
He ran forward presently and grasped the tall soldier by the arm. "'Jim! Jim!' he coaxed. "'Come with me!' The tall soldier weakly tried to wrench himself free. "'Huh?' he said vacantly. He stared at the youth for a moment. At last he spoke as if dimly comprehending. "'Oh, in the fields?' "'Oh!' He started blindly through the grass. The youth turned once to look at the lashing riders and jouncing guns of the battery. He was startled from this view by a shrill outcry from the tattered man. "'God! He's running!' Turning his head swiftly, the youth saw his friend running in a staggering and stumbling way toward a little clump of bushes. His heart seemed to wrench itself almost free from his body at this sight. He made a noise of pain. He and the tattered man began a pursuit. There was a singular race. When he overtook the tall soldier, he began to plead with all the words he could find. "'Jim! Jim! What are you doing? What makes you do this way? You hurt yourself!' The same purpose was in the tall soldier's face. He protested in a dull way, keeping his eyes fastened on the mystic place of his intentions. "'No! No! Don't touch me! Leave me be! Leave me be!' The youth, aghast and filled with wonder at the tall soldier, began quiveringly to question him. "'Where are you going, Jim? What are you thinking about? Where are you going? Tell me, won't you, Jim?' The tall soldier faced about as upon relentless pursuers. In his eyes there was a great appeal. "'Leave me be, can't you? Leave me be for a minute?' The youth recoiled. "'Why, Jim,' he said in a dazed way, "'what's the matter with you?' The tall soldier turned, and lurching dangerously went on. The youth and tattered soldier followed, sneaking as if whipped, feeling unable to face the stricken man if he should again confront them. They began to have thoughts of a solemn ceremony. There was something right-like in these movements of the doomed soldier, and there was a resemblance in him to a devotee of a mad religion, blood-sucking, muscle-wrenching, bone-crushing. They were awed and afraid. They hung back lest he have at command a dreadful weapon. At last they saw him stop and stand motionless. Hastening up, they perceived that his face wore an expression, telling that he had at last found the place for which he had struggled. His spare figure was erect. His bloody hands were quietly at his side. He was waiting with patience for something that he had come to meet. He was at the rendezvous. They paused and stood expectant. There was a silence. Finally, the chest of the doomed soldier began to heave with a strained motion. It increased in violence until it was as if an animal was within, and was kicking and tumbling furiously to be free. The spectacle of gradual strangulation made the youth writhe, and once, as his friend rolled his eyes, he saw something in them that made him sink, wailing to the ground. He raised his voice in a last supreme call. "'Jim! Jim! Jim!' Jim! The tall soldier opened his lips and spoke. He made a gesture. Leave me be. Don't touch me. Leave me be. There was another silence while he waited. Suddenly his form stiffened and straightened. Then it was shaken by a prolonged hog. He stared into space. To the two watchers there was a curious and profound dignity in the firm lines of his awful face. He was invaded by a creeping strangeness that slowly enveloped him. For a moment the tremor of his legs caused him to dance a sort of hideous hornpipe. His arms beat wildly about his head in expression of implacable enthusiasm. His tall figure stretched itself to its full height. There was a slight rendering sound. Then it began to swing forward, slow, straight, in the manner of a falling tree. A swift, muscular concussion made the left shoulder strike the ground first. The body seemed to bounce a little away from the earth. "'God!' said the tattered soldier. The youth had watched spellbound this ceremony at the place of meeting. His face had been twisted into an expression of every agony he had imagined for his friend. He now sprang to his feet, and going closer, gazed upon the paste-like face. The mouth was open, and the teeth showed in a laugh. As the flap of the blue jacket fell away from the body, he could see that the side looked as if it had been chewed by wolves. The youth turned with sudden livid rage toward the battlefield. He shook at his fist. 
He seemed about to deliver a philippic. Hell! The red sun was pasted in the sky like a wafer. Chapter 10 The tattered man stood musing. Well, he was a regular Jim Dandy for nerve, wasn't he? said he finally in a little awestruck voice. Regular Jim Dandy. He thoughtfully poked one of the docile hands with his foot. I wonder where he's got his strength from. I never seen a man do like that before. It was a funny thing. Well, he was a regular Jim Dandy. The youth desired to stretch out his grief. He was stabbed, but his tongue lay dead in the tomb of his mouth. He threw himself again upon the ground and began to brood. The tattered man stood musing. "'Look here, partner,' he said after a time. He regarded the corpse as he spoke. "'It up and gone, any, and we might as well begin to look out for old number one. This here thing is all over. He'd up and gone, any, And he's all right here. Nobody won't bother him. And I must say, I ain't enjoying any great health myself these days.' The youth, awakened by the tattered soldier's tone, looked quickly up. He saw that he was swinging uncertainly on his legs, that his face had turned to a shade of blue. "'Good Lord!' he cried. "'You ain't going to—' "'Not you, too?' The tattered man waved his hand. "'Nary die,' he said. "'All I want is some pea-soup and a good bed. Some pea-soup,' he repeated dreamily. The youth arose from the ground. I wonder where he came from. I left him over there, he pointed, and now I find him here. And he was coming from over there, too. He indicated a new direction. They both turned toward the body as if to ask of it a question. Well, at length spoke the tattered man, there ain't no use in our staying here and trying to ask him anything. The youth nodded an assent warily. They both turned to gaze for a moment at the corpse. The youth murmured something. "'Well, he was a Jim Danny, wasn't he?' said the tattered man, as if in response. They turned their backs upon it and started away. For a time they stole softly, treading with their toes. It remained laughing there in the grass. "'I'm commencing to feel pretty bad,' said the tattered man, suddenly breaking one of his little silences. I'm commencing to feel pretty damn bad. The youth groaned, Oh, Lord! He wondered if he was to be the tortured witness of another grim encounter. But his companion waved his hand reassuringly. Oh, I'm not going to die yet. There's too much dependin' on me for me to die yet. Oh, sir, nearly die. I can't. You ought to see what the children I got, and all like that. The youth, glancing at his companion, could see by the shadow of a smile that he was making some kind of fun. As they plodded on, the tattered soldier continued to talk. Besides, if I died, I wouldn't die the way that feller did. That was the funniest thing. I just flopped down, I would. I, I never seen a feller die the way that feller did. You know, Tom Jameson, he lives next door to me at home. He was a nice feller. And he is and we is always good friends, smart too, smart as a steel trap. Well, when we was fighting this afternoon, all of a sudden he began to rip up and cuss and beller at me. You shot, you blamed infernal. He swore horrible. He says to me, I put up me hand to my head, and I'm when I looked at it, my fingers I seen sure enough I was shot. I give a holler and began to run, but before I could get away another one hit me in the arm whirl me clean around i got scared when they was all shooting behind me and i, I run to beat all but i touched it pretty bad i've an idea i'd have been fighting yet if it weren't for tom jameson then he made a calm announcement there are two of them little ones but they're beginning to have fun with me now i don't believe i can walk much further they went slowly on in silence you look pretty peaked yourself, said the tattered man at last. I bet you're got a worse one than you think. You better take care of your hurt. It don't do to let such things go. It might be inside mostly, and then plays thunder. 
Where is it located? But he continued to harangue without waiting for a reply. I see a feller get hit plumb in the head when my regiment was standing at ease once. Everybody yelled out to him, Hurt, John? Are you hurt much? No, says he. He looked kind of surprised, and he went on telling him how he felt. He said he didn't feel nothing. But by dad, the first thing that feller knowed, he was dead. Yes, he was dead, stone dead. So you want to watch out. You might have some queer kind of hurt yourself. You can't never tell. Where is your unlocated? The youth had been wiggling since the introduction of this topic. He now gave a cry of exasperation and made a furious motion with his hand. Oh, don't bother me, he said. He was enraged against the tattered man and could have strangled him. His companions seemed ever to play intolerable parts. They were ever uprising the ghost of shame on the stick of their curiosity. He turned toward the tattered man as one at bay. Now, don't bother me, he repeated with desperate menace. Well, Lord knows I don't want to bother anybody, said the other. There was a little accent of despair in his voice as he replied, Lord knows i got enough of my own to tend to. The youth, who had been holding a bitter debate with himself and casting glances of hatred and contempt at the tattered man, here spoke in a hard voice. Goodbye, he said. The tattered man looked at him in gaping amazement. All right, my partner, where are you going? He asked unsteadily. The youth looking at him could see that he, too, like the other one, was beginning to act dumb and animal-like. His thoughts seemed to be floundering about in his head. Now, now, look at here, you Tom Jamison. Now, I, I won't have this. This here won't do. Where are you going? The youth pointed vaguely. Over there, he replied. Well, man, look at here now, said the tattered man, rambling in an idiot fashion. His head was hanging forward, and the words were slurred. This thing won't do now, Tom Jamison. It won't do. I know you. I know you, pig-headed devil. You want to go tromping off with a bad herd? It ain't right now, Tom Jamison. It ain't. You want to leave me here to take care of you, Tom Jamison? It ain't right. It ain't. For you to go tromping off with a bad herd, it ain't. It ain't. It ain't. It ain't. It ain't. In reply, the youth climbed a fence and started away. He could hear the tattered man bleeding plaintively. Once he faced about angry. What? Look here now, Tom Jamison. Now it ain't. It ain't. The youth went on. Turning at a distance, he saw the tattered man wandering about helplessly in the field. He now thought that he wished he was dead. He believed that he envied those men whose bodies lay strewn over the grass of the fields on the fallen leaves of the forest. The simple questions of the tattered man had been knife-thrust to him. They asserted a society that probes piteously at secrets until all is apparent. His late companion's chance persistence made him feel that he could not keep his crime concealed in his bosom. It was sure to be brought plain by one of those arrows which cloud the air, and are constantly pricking, discovering, proclaiming those things which are willed to be forever hidden. He admitted that he could not defend himself against this agency. It was not within the power of vigilance. Chapter 11 He became aware that the furnace roar of the battle was growing louder. Great brown clouds had floated to the still heights of air before him. The noise, too, was approaching. The woods filtered men, and the fields became dotted. As he rounded a hillock, he perceived that the roadway was now a crying mass of wagons, teams, and men. From the heaving tangle issued extortations, commands, imprecations. Fear was sweeping it all along. The cracking whips bit, and horses plunged and tugged. The white-topped wagons strained and stumbled in their exhortations like fat sheep. The youth felt comforted in a measure by this sight. They were all retreating. Perhaps then he was not so bad, after all. He seated himself and watched the terror-stricken wagons. They fled like soft, ungainly animals. 
All the roars and lashers served to help him to magnify the dangers and horrors of the engagement, that he might try to prove to himself that the thing with which men could charge him was in truth a symmetrical act. There was an amount of pleasure to him in watching the wild march of this vindication. Presently the calm head of a forward-going column of infantry appeared in the road. It came swiftly on, avoiding the obstructions, gave it the sinuous movement of a serpent. The men at the head butted mules with their musket tocks. They prodded teamsters indifferent to all howls. The men forced their way through parts of the dense mass by strength. The blunt head of the column pushed. The raving teamsters swore many strange oaths. The commands to make way had the ring of a great importance to them. The men were going forward to the heart of the din. They were to confront the eager rush of the enemy. They felt the pride of their onward movement when the remainder of the army seemed trying to dribble down this road. They tumbled teams about with a fine feeling that was no matter so long as their column got to the front in time. This importance made their faces grave and stern, and the backs of the officers were very rigid. As the youth looked at them, the black weight of his woe returned to him. He felt he was regarding a procession of chosen beings. The separation was as great to him as if they had marched with weapons of flame and banners of sunlight. He could never be like them. He could have wept in his longings. He searched about in his mind for an adequate valedication for the indefinite cause, the thing upon which men turn the words of final blame. It, whatever it was, was responsible for him, he said. There lay the fault. The haste of the column to reach the battle seemed to the forlorn young man to be something much finer than stout fighting. Heroes, he thought, could find excuses in that long, seething lane. They could retire with perfect self-respect and make excuses to the stars. He wondered what those men had eaten that they could be in such great haste to force their way to grim chances of death. As he watched, his envy grew until he thought that he wished to change lives with one of them. He would have liked to have used a tremendous force, he said, throw off himself and become a better. Swift pictures of himself, apart, yet in himself, came to him, a blue, desperate figure, leading lurid charges with one knee forward and a broken blade, high, a blue, determined figure, standing before a crimson and steel assault, getting calmly killed on a high place before the eyes of all. He thought of the magnificent pathos of his dead body. These thoughts uplifted him. He felt the quiver of war desire. In his ears he heard the ring of victory. He knew the frenzy of a rapid, successful charge. The music of the trampling feet, the sharp voices, the clanking arms of the column near him made him soar on the red wings of war. For a few moments he was sublime. He thought that he was about to start for the front. Indeed, he saw a picture of himself, dust-stained, haggard, panting, flying to the front at the proper moment to seize and throttle the dark, leering witch of calamity. Then the difficulties of the thing began to drag at him. He hesitated, balancing awkwardly on one foot. He had no rifle. He could not fight with his hands, said he resentfully to his plan. Well, rifles could be had for the picking. They were extraordinarily profuse. Also, he continued, it would be a miracle if he found his regiment. Well, he could fight with any regiment. He started forward slowly. He stepped as if he expected to tread upon some explosive thing. Doubts and he were struggling. He would truly be a worm if any of his comrades should see him returning thus. The marks of his flight upon him. There was a reply that the intent fighters did not care for what happened, rearward saving that no hostile bayonets appeared there. In the battle blur his face would in a way be hidden, like the face of a cowled man. But then he said that his tireless fate would bring forth, when the strife lulled for a moment, a man to ask of him an explanation. In imagination he felt the scrutiny of his companions as he painfully labored through some lies. Eventually his courage expended itself upon these objections. The debates drained him of his fire. He was not cast down by his defeat of his plan, for upon studying the affair carefully 
he could not but admit that the objections were very formidable. Furthermore, various ailments had begun to cry out. In their presence he could not persist in flying high with the wings of war. They rendered it almost impossible for him to see himself in a heroic light. He tumbled headlong. He discovered that he had a scorching thirst. His face was so dry and grimy that he thought he could feel his skin crackle. Each bone of his body had an ache in it, and seemingly threatened to break with each movement. His feet were like two sores. Also, his body was calling for food. It was more powerful than a direct hunger. There was a dull, weight-like feeling in his stomach, and when he tried to walk, his head swayed, and he tottered. He could not see with distinctness. Small patches of green mist floated before his vision. While he had been tossed by many emotions, he had not been aware of ailments. Now they beset him and made clamor. As he was at last compelled to pay attention to them, his capacity for self-hate was multiplied. In despair he declared that he was not like those others. He now conceded it to be impossible that he should ever become a hero. He was a craven loon. Those pictures of glory were piteous things. He groaned from his heart and went staggering off. A certain moth-like quality within him kept him in the vicinity of the battle. He had a great desire to see and to get news. He wished to know who was winning. He told himself that despite his unprecedented suffering, he had never lost his greed for a victory. Yet he said, in a half-apologetic manner to his conscience, he could not but know that a defeat for the army this time might mean many favorable things for him. The blows of the enemy would splinter regiments into fragments. Thus many men of courage, he considered, would be obliged to desert the colors and scurry like chickens. He would appear to be one of them. They would be sullen brothers in distress, and he could then easily believe he had not run any further or faster than they. And if he himself could believe in his virtuous perfection, he conceived that there would be small trouble in convincing all others. He said, as if in excuse for this hope, that previously the army had encountered great defeats, and in a few months then shaken off all blood and tradition of them emerging as bright and valiant as a new one, thrusting out of sight the memory of disaster, and appearing with the valor and confidence of unconquered legions. The shrilling voices of the people at home would pipe dismally for a time, but various generals were usually compelled to listen to these ditties. He, of course, felt no compunction of for proposing a general as a sacrifice. He could not tell who the chosen for the barbs might be, so he could center no direct sympathy upon him. The people were afar, and he did not conceive public opinion to be accurate at long range. It was quite probable they would hit the wrong man who, after he had recovered from his amazement, would perhaps spend the rest of his days in writing replies to the songs of his alleged failure. It would be very unfortunate, no doubt, but in this case a general was of no consequence to the youth. In a defeat there would be a roundabout vindication of himself. He thought it would prove in a manner that he had fled early because of his superior powers of perception. A serious prophet upon predicting a flood should be the first man to climb a tree. This would demonstrate that he was indeed a seer. A moral vindication was regarded by the youth as a very important thing. Without salve, he could not, he thought, wear the sore badge of his dishonor through life. With his heart continually assuring him that he was despicable, he could not exist without making it, through his actions apparent to all men. If the army had gone gloriously on, he would be lost. If the din meant that now his army's flags were tilted forward, he was a condemned wretch. He would be compelled to doom himself to isolation. If the men were advancing, their indifferent feet were trampling upon his chances for a successful life. As these thoughts went rapidly through his mind, he turned upon them and tried to thrust them away. He denounced himself as a villain. He said that he was the most utterly selfish man in existence. His mind pictured the soldiers who would place their defiant bodies before the spear of the yelling battle-fiend, 
and as he saw their dripping corpses on an imagined field, he said that he was their murderer. Again he thought that he wished he was dead. He believed that he envied a corpse. Thinking of the slain, he achieved a great contempt for some of them, as if they were guilty for this becoming lifeless. They might not have been killed by lucky chance, he said, before they had opportunities to flee or before they had been really tested. Yet they would receive laurels from tradition. He cried out bitterly that their crowns were stolen and their robes of glorious memories were shams. However, he still said that it was a great pity he was not as they. A defeat of the army had suggested itself to him as a means of escape from the consequences of his fall. He considered now, however, that it was useless to think of such a possibility. His education had been that success for that mighty blue machine was certain, that it would make victories as a contrivance turns out buttons. He presently discarded all his speculations in the other direction. He returned to the creed of soldiers. When he perceived again that it was not possible for the army to be defeated, he tried to bethink him of a fine tale which he could take back to his regiment, and with it turn the expected shafts of derision. But as he morally feared these shafts, it became impossible for him to invent a tale he felt he could trust. He experimented with many schemes, but threw them aside one by one as flimsy. He was quick to see vulnerable places in them all. Furthermore, he was much afraid that some arrow of scorn might lay him mentally low before he could raise his protecting tail. He imagined the whole regiment saying, "'Where's Henry Fleming? He run, didn't he?' "'Oh, my!' He recalled various persons who would be quite sure to leave him no peace about it. They would doubtless question him with sneers and laugh at his stammering hesitation. In the next engagement, they would try to keep watch on him to discover when he would run. Wherever he went in camp, he would encounter insolent and lingeringly cruel stares. As he imagined himself passing near a crowd of comrades, he could hear someone say, "'There he goes.' Then, as if the heads were moved by one muscle, all the faces were turned toward him with wide, derisive grins. He seemed to hear someone make a humorous remark in a low tone. At it, the others cowed and cackled. He was a slang phrase. Chapter 12 The column that had butted stoutly at the obstacles in the roadway was barely out of the youth's sight before he saw dark waves of men come sweeping out of the woods and down through the fields. He knew at once that the steel fibers had been washed from their hearts. They were bursting from their coats and their equipments as from entanglements. They charged down upon him like terrified buffaloes. Behind them blue smoke curled and clouded above the treetops, and through the thickets he could sometimes see a distant pink glare. The voices of the cannon were clamoring in interminable chorus. The youth was horror-stricken. He stared in agony and amazement. He forgot that he was engaged in combating the universe. He threw aside his mental pamphlets on the philosophy of the retreated and rules of the guidance of the damned. The fight was lost. The dragons were coming with invincible strides. The army, helpless in the matted thickets and blinded by the overhanging night, was going to be swallowed. War, the red animal war, the blood-swollen god, would have bloated fill. Within him something bade to cry out. He had the impulse to make a rallying speech, to sing a battle hymn, but he could only get his tongue to call into the air. Why, why, what, what, what's the matter? Soon he was in the midst of them. They were leaping and scampering all about him. Their blanched faces shone in the dusk. They seemed, for the most part, to be very burly men. The youth turned from one to another of them as they galloped along. His incoherent questions were lost. They were heedless of his appeals. They did not seem to see him. They sometimes grabbed insanely. One huge man was asking of the sky, "'Say, where de plank road? Where de plank road?' It was as if he had lost a child. He wept in his pain and dismay. Presently men were running hither and thither in all ways. The artillery booming forward, rearward, and on the flanks made jumble of ideas of direction. Landmarks had vanished into the gathered gloom. The youth began to imagine that he had got into the center of a tremendous quarrel, and he could perceive no way out of it. 
From the mouths of the fleeing men came a thousand wild questions, but no one made answers. The youth, after rushing about and throwing interrogations at the heedless bands of retreating infantry, finally clutched a man by the arm. They swung around face to face. "'Why, why?' stammered the youth, struggling with his balking tongue. The man screamed, "'Let go of me! Let go of me!' His face was livid, and his eyes were rolling uncontrolled. He was heaving and panting. He still grasped his rifle, perhaps having forgotten to release his hold upon it. He tugged frantically, and the youth, being compelled to lean forward, was dragged several paces. "'Let go of me! Let go of me! Why, why?' started the youth. "'Well, then,' bawled the man in a lurid rage. He adroitly and fiercely swung his rifle. It crushed upon the youth's head. The man ran on. The youth's fingers had turned to paste upon the other's arm. The energy was smitten from his muscles. He saw the flaming wings of lightning flash before his vision. There was a deafening rumble of thunder within his head. Suddenly his legs seemed to die. He sank, writhing to the ground. He tried to arise. In his efforts against the numbing pain, he was like a man wrestling with a creature of the air. There was a sinister struggle. Sometimes he would achieve a position, half erect, battle with the air for a moment, and then fall again, grabbing at the grass. His face was of the clammy pallor. Deep groans were wrenched from him. At last, with a twisting movement, he got up on his hands and knees, and from thence, like a babe trying to walk to his feet, pressing his hands to his temples, he went lurching over the grass. He fought an intense battle with his body. His dull senses wished him to swoon, and he opposed them stubbornly, his mind portraying unknown dangers and mutilations if he should fall upon the field. He went tall soldier fashion. He imagined secluded spots where he could fall and be unmolested. To search for one he strove against the tide of his pain. Once he put his hand to the top of his head and timidly touched the wound. The scratching pain of the contact made him draw a long breath through his clenched teeth. His fingers were dabbed with blood. He regarded them with a fixed stare. Around him he could hear the grumble of jolted cannon as the scurrying horses were lashed toward the front. Once a young officer on a besplod charger nearly ran him down. He turned and watched the mass of guns, men, and horses sweeping in a wide curve toward a gap in the fence. The officer was making excited motions with a gauntleted hand. The guns followed the teams with an air of unwillingness, of being dragged by the heels. Some officers of the scattered infantry were cursing and railing like fishwives. Their scolding voices could be heard above the din. Into the unspeakable jumble in the roadway rode a squadron of cavalry. The faded yellow of their facings shone bravely. There was a mighty altercation. The artillery was assembling as if for a conference. The blue haze of evening was upon the field. The lines of forest were long purple shadows. One cloud lay along the western sky, partly smothering the red. As the youth left the scene behind him, he heard the guns suddenly roar out. He imagined them shaking in black rage. They belched and howled like brass devils guarding a gate. The soft air was filled with a tremendous remonstrance. With it came the shattering peal of opposing infantry. Turning to look behind him, he could see sheets of orange light illumine the shadowy distance. There were subtle and sudden lightnings in the far air. At times he thought he could see heaving masses of men. He hurried on in the dusk. The day had faded until he could barely distinguish place for his feet. The purple darkness was filled with men who lectured and jabbered. Sometimes he could see them gesticulating against the blue and somber sky. There seemed to be a great ruck of men and munitions spread about in the forest and in the fields. The little narrow roadway now lay lifeless. There were overturned wagons like sun-dried boulders. The bed of the former torrent was choked with the bodies of horses and splintered parts of war machines. It had come to pass that his wound pained him but little. He was afraid to move rapidly, however, for a dread of disturbing it. He held his head very still, and took many precautions against stumbling. He was filled with anxiety, and his face was pinched and drawn, in anticipation of the pain of any sudden mistake of his feet in the gloom. His thoughts as he walked fixed intently upon his hurt. There was a cool, liquid feeling about it, and he imagined blood moving slowly down under his hair. His head seemed swollen to the size that made him think his neck to be inadequate. The new silence of his wound made much worriment. 
the little blistering voices of pain that had called out from his scalp were he thought definite in their expression of danger by them he believed that he could measure his plight but when they remained ominously silent he became frightened and imagined terrible fingers that clutched into his brain amid it he began to reflect upon various incidents and conditions of the past he bethought him of certain meals his mother had cooked at home in which those dishes of which he was particularly fond had occupied prominent positions he saw the spread table the pine walls of the kitchen were glowing in the warm light from the stove too he remembered how he and his companions used to go from the schoolhouse to the bank of a shaded pool he saw his clothes in disorderly array upon the grass of the bank he felt the swash of the fragrant water upon his body the leaves of the overhanging maple rustled with melody in the wind of youthful summer he was overcome presently by a dragging weariness his head hung forward and his shoulders were stooped as if he were bearing a great bundle his feet shuffled along the ground he held continuous arguments as to whether he should lie down and sleep at some near spot or force himself on until he reached a certain haven he often tried to dismiss the question but his body persisted in rebellion and his senses nagged him like pampered babies at last he heard a cheery voice near his shoulder you seem to be in a pretty bad way boy the youth did not look up but he assented with a thick tongue uh -huh. the owner of the cheery voice took him firmly by the arm well he said with a round laugh i'm going your way the whole gang is going your way and i guess we can give you a lift they began to walk like a drunken man and his friend as they went along the man questioned the youth and assisted him with the replies like one manipulating the mind of a child sometimes he interjected anecdotes what regiment do you belong to eh what's that the three o fourth new york what corps is that in what oh, is why i thought they wasn't engaged today they're way down or center oh they was eh well pretty nearly everybody got their share of fighting today by dad i give myself up for dead many number of times they was shootin here and hollerin there and hollerin here and there hollerin there and damn darkness until i couldn't tell save my soul which side i was on sometimes i thought i was sure enough from ohio or s other times i could have swore i was from the bitter end of florida it was the most mixed up darn thing i ever see and these here hull woods is a regular mess it'll be a miracle if we ever find our regiments tonight. pretty soon though we'll meet a plenty of guards and provost guards and one thing or another oh there they go with an officer i guess look at his hand a dragon he's got all the war he wants i bet he won't be talking so big about his reputation and all when they go to sawing off his leg poor feller my brother's got whiskers just like that how did you get your way over here anyhow your regiment is a long way from here ain't it well i guess we can find it you know there was a boy killed in my company today that i thought the world of all of jack was a nice feller by ginger it hurt like thunder to see old jack just get knocked flat we was a standin pretty peaceable for a spell though there was men runnin every way all around us and while we was a standin like that long comes a big fat feller he began to peck at jack's elbow and says say where's the road to the river and jack he never paid no attention and that feller kept on a peckin at his elbow and saying say where's the road to the river jack was lookin ahead all the time trying to see the johnnies comin through the woods and he never paid no attention to the big fat feller for a long time but at last he turned around and he says ah go to hell and find the road to the river and just then a shot slapped him bang on the side of the head he was a sergeant too them was his last words thunder i wish we was sure of finding our regiments to-night it's going to be a long hunting but i guess we can do it in the search which followed the man of the cheery voice seemed to the youth to possess a wand of a magic kind he threaded the mazes of the tangled forest with a strange fortune in encounters with guards and patrols he displayed the keenness of a detective and the valor of a gamin obstacles fell before him and became of assistance the youth with his chin still on his breast stood woodenly by while his companion beat ways and means out of sullen things 
The forest seemed a vast hive of men buzzing about in frantic circles, but the cheery man conducted the youth without mistakes until at last he began to chuckle with glee and self-satisfaction. Ah, uh -huh, there you are. See that fire? The youth nodded stupidly. Well, there's where your regiment is. And now, good-bye, old boy. Good luck to you. A warm and strong ham clasped the youth's languid fingers for an instant, and then he heard a cheerful and audacious whistling as the man strode away, as he who had so befriended him was thus passing out of his life. It suddenly occurred to the youth that he had not once seen his face.